God bless you, our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, and welcome back to another Bible study. Before Pastor Harden comes forth and takes us into today's lesson, let us all go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, holy, righteous God, holy is your name. Holy and righteous are your ways, O God. And holy is your only begotten Son who is faithful and true. Blessed Father, righteous Father, we come before you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son who is on your right hand, who is alive forevermore. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for sending your Son into this world to pay the price for our sins. We thank you for his blood that was shed. And we thank you, O God, for resurrecting him and giving us hope of eternal life. Thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name, O God. We thank you, King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, holy and righteous ruler in the kingdom of men. Father God, thank you for an opportunity to have another Bible study. Father, thank you for ordering our footsteps. It is truly amazing, Lord, to see how you order our footsteps for the Bible studies for us all to learn and how it lines up with the things that are going on. We see, oh God, that you are in control and we see that you are the ruler in the kingdom of men and we see, oh God, that you are long suffering. Bless your holy name. You are patient and you are kind and we thank you, Lord. You are long suffering, not willing that any should perish. And God, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you, O oh God. You didn't make it difficult. You didn't say that somebody had to climb to the highest mountain and sacrifice a body part. You made it simple by saying that we are to believe that your son Jesus is Lord. And Father, we thank you, O oh God. Father God, we pray for those who believe that your son Jesus is Lord and they believe you are the one and only most high God, but they haven't been baptized. Bless them, O God, to be baptized. Bless them, Father, as your son said, to suffer all righteousness to be fulfilled. Bless them, Father God, to be filled with your Holy Spirit and to walk according to your statutes and to bring forth good fruits for your glory, to bring forth good works for your glory and your son's glory. Father God, we pray your blessings on the Bible study today. Blessed, O oh God, bless the teacher, Father. Bless my husband to be anointed to teach the way you want it to be taught, to say what you want to be said. And Father, we ask if you would bless the hearers to not just hear your word, but to heed your word, to obey your word, to hide it in their hearts and Bless them, God, to bless your people, O oh God, to know how to stand in truth and to stand in righteousness and to proclaim, boldly proclaim what is true, your son being that truth. And we thank you, God. We bless you, Holy Father. Lord God, we pray for your kingdom to come and for your will to be done in all the earth as it is in heaven. And your son said that the kingdom was within us. So, Father, bless the kingdom to be in everybody. Bless the kingdom to be in all of us, that you may be glorified and your son may be glorified and for the glory of your kingdom. Father, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. We bless you, O God. We bless you, Father. We bless you, King Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us now join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible study lesson. God bless you. Well, God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of United by Their Christ Church, which is an online ministry. On behalf of my family and myself, we'd like to take this opportunity to welcome back your families, to welcome back yourselves, back to another broadcast, back to another Bible study. Today we are coming at you with uh, Habakkuk, Habakkuk. So uh, that should, we should be able to cover, it's about three chapters there. Uh, however, the third chapter is just a, a song of prayer and praise. 
Uh, so we're, we're still, we'll still read it, Lord willing, we'll still read it. Uh, but the, our content for today is going to come out of the first and second chapter. So we should be able to record uh, the whole book of Habakkuk today. So I'm actually looking forward to that. I, I thank the Lord God, um, my wife that has uh, opened us up with prayer to get us started. So to God be the glory. Uh, God is the chef, the bread that God has prepared for us to break and to receive. That bread is the word of life. It's the bread of life, the word of life, who also is the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, God being our chef, that meal that we're about to break, to, this bread that we're about to break together, it's the word of God. It's the bread of life. Again, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has given you that appetite, those things that are of heaven, that we desire, it's that holy appetite that the Spirit of God has given us uh, that moves us to fellowship, to sup, to commune. Uh, it's the Holy Ghost of God dwelling inside of us. So that's our way of honoring the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In the understanding that you receive from this Bible study, it's not because of my wife or myself. It's because God has gave it for you to have. He has given it to you that you may receive it. You may gain understanding. You may know how to worship him in spirit and in truth. That you use it to draw closer that which he has given you. He's given it to edify you. Amen. To fortify you. So to God be the glory. Uh, mentioning my wife, I bless God for her. My help, my friend. Uh, my partner, my love, uh, bless God to have uh, the, the woman that, that he's given me for these over 20 years. We're actually coming up on 21 years, and, and to God be the glory that he would give me someone that loves him and then someone that loves me. So I, I bless God for his generosity towards my family and myself. Amen. Very interesting book, Habakkuk. Very interesting. We don't know, um, I, I don't know a lot about his genealogy, but the conversation that he has with God is really, it's, it touches my heart. So I'm really looking forward to getting into it. Uh, man may not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord who is our God. So let's get into it. So let me kind of set the backdrop to this. Uh, Habakkuk is a prophet. God has given him uh, a prophecy about what was to come. Now, he had been praying to God constantly and what we deem to be for a while concerning the conditions of his community, the conditions of his nation. Uh, because we are reading about the Babylonians, we have to assume that his complaint is for the tribe of Judah and about the going zones <laughs> in their land. And, and, and he's talking about the deterioration of justice, of morality. He's, he's in his prayer to God concerning the fall of his community, um, the violence that have, that, that have become a natural way of life. When we look at the state of our own country, we look and, and we find the goodness. I mean, I, let me, I'll be the first to say that uh, I love where I live, where my family and I reside. I, I love the job that I'm able to go and work daily, the community in which I live, um, the country that I live in. Love it. Wouldn't wouldn't trade it for any other nation. Not even looking to to explore other nations. I'm very very happy with this one as far as what this country offers and what I'm able to offer the country in return. I love that. There are some problems that plague our nation. There are some problems that plague our our communities. Now my community is not as bad as other communities, okay? 
And when you read the reports of a lot of other communities, surrounding communities, you, you bless God. You'll take the, the you'll take what's going on in yours over what's what's what else is going on in somebody's, right? Somebody else's. But there's still a concern about the path uh, that our nation is, is headed in. There is, you know, where we are and how bad things are getting. It seems like the wicked outweigh the righteous in our nation and that the righteous have to keep silent and just allow what they're seeing happening around them. And if you speak up and speak out, you know, you can... People want to deem you as, you know, as, as because of what you're saying, they may call it hate speech because you're not allowed to, 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 to call out anything that's wicked. They'll call you an extremist. And all of these things is to shut you up and shut you down, right, so that you can't broadcast your dismay about the perversions and the wickedness and the dishonesty that's happening, the violence, the looting, the plundering. So Habakkuk sees these things happening in his own community. And he has this relationship with God to where he goes to God and begins to talk to God about, hey, look at these things happening. How long will you allow them to keep manifesting? You, you, you're causing me to look at all of these things and I'm grieved by what I see. And you won't. I don't know if I'm more grieved by what I see or the fact that you're not doing anything about it. You know, so these are things that come up uh, between a Habakkuk, you know, and his conversations with God concerning that. So, you know, again, just to kind of bring it into modern terms, it's those things that grieve you and bother you about what you see happening in, in your own nation and how you're constantly praying to God that that righteousness prevail that justice prevail this is the, the 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 things that's going on with habakkuk so that's kind of the backdrop there so let's get right into it uh habakkuk uh and and his name means embracer or clinger the one you know the a person that clings or embracer he's known as the embracer amen so that's pretty interesting so let's get right into it habakkuk Chapter 1, verse 1. The burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. So it's this prophecy. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. So, it's, so the question is, what grieves me most, that which I see, or that which I see and you're not addressing? The fact that you're not addressing what I see, you know, what what grieves me most? And that question comes up here. Why doest thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that ride, that raise up strife and contentions. So again, this is as, as I was given the backdrop. The, the, the things that really grieve him. You can't go out in broad daylight because what used to happen at nighttime has now spilled over into the daytime. And sin is brazen. It evolves, right? It gets worse. It's, it's, it, it used to be locked behind closed doors and the secrets of, of one's houses, but now it comes out in broad daylight and out in the open. And it get becomes brazen, right, to where it's no longer trying to hide what it's doing. It's all out in the open. It's a problem. And, and he brings this to God, and he's like, how long do I have to indulge this? Do, do people like me have to indulge this? That's not right. And he was like, there are they that raise up strife and contention. They look, they, it's like they're employed to start problems, to make problems. They're in the whole game in when they wake up to start their day, the, the start of their day is what what trouble can I solve? What violence can I be a, can I participate in or, or could I produce? What what is it that I can get myself into today? How what mischief, what menace to society 
you know, can, can I be involved in? It's just, that's where it is, right? And so he begins to say in his prayer to God, therefore the law is slack and judgment doeth never go forth. For the wicked do compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceeded. So he was like the wicked outweigh the righteous. You know? And he was like we can't look at the law because there are so many that are perverted. Even those that set over the law, they're perverted. They're bought, they're, they've been bought and uh, uh, they've been sold. Justice has been brought and paid for, been bought and paid for by the wicked. They sit on councils and judges' offices and, and various things of the sort. And he was like, they, it seems like, and isn't it like when you go to a movie, if you, those of you that still go to movies or what have you, if you try to watch a family movie, you know, or maybe the Transformers or something like that. And it seems like the enemy always had the biggest and the best, right? And, and it's always like the enemy always seems to outnumber, outgun and outnumber the forces of good, right? And he has this complaint here and he has that same complaint in verse 4. The law is slack, judgment doeth never go forth, for the wicked do compass about the righteous. And he said how the, the wicked outnumbers the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceeded. Now, this is his complaint. And what you can deem from this is this is a good relationship between him and the Lord. Because he's constantly in contact with God concerning his problems or concerning his community problems, his nation's problems uh, uh, that has plagued his community. And he's on his knees, which is where he needs to be, which is where we need to be. Remember, these things are written for our understanding, right? To see what to do and what not to do. And we are to bring our concerns, our cares. We're to bring them before the Lord. And that's what he's doing, okay? And he's very detailed in, <laughs> in his prayer, okay? Now, God answers him. God responds uh, to his, his concerns, his complaints. God, God has something to say. So let's drop down to verse 5. Behold, ye among the heathen in regard, wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. So God says, look at the nations. I'm going to do something in the midst of the nations that that will raise eyebrows. And if someone told you what would happen, you wouldn't believe it. All right? God says, I'm going to do this work. For lo, I rise up the I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of them. So he says their reputation precedes them. This is pretty interesting because God says, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. Now I want to hold your place there. And, and God is saying, uh, first of all, let me explain that a little more and then I want to reference the scripture here. When God says that their reputation precedes them, and, and look what he says here when he, when he talks about the, the repetition. He says they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their, and their uh, 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 dignity shall proceed of themselves. So God says they have no dignity about themselves. None. They don't, they don't care. They don't, they, they don't have this integrity or, or, or this moral character about themselves. They're the opposite. They're a bunch of barbarians. They're a bunch of brutes. They're a bunch of, uh, of mercenaries that, that hunger and thirst for blood, right? And, and, but God says, I'm, I'm raising them up. What? You're raising them up? Now, look, go with me to this verse here. Go with me to Isaiah. We want to look at Isaiah chapter 45, verses, seven, verses 5 through 7. Isaiah chapter 45, uh, verses 5 through 7.
Now look at what this says. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. So look at that in context of the Chaldees. I'm the one that's given you power to go do what you're doing, even though you don't know me, right? He goes to say that, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, that so from the rising of the sun in the east, from the rising in the east to the going down in the west, that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is none else. Here's what we want to focus on. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And so now, when we go back to Habakkuk, we'll reread verse 6 and 7. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the width of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. So even though they don't know God, God is using them to exact justice in a sense, right? And, and <laughs> this, is, this is the way the Lord does it. It's, it's, it's some heavy stuff here. I digress. There's some scripture to cover. Verse 8. Their horses are also swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. They, they shall fly as an eagle that hastens to eat. So you know how, how an eagle drop out of the sky, swoop down on his prey and go back up, right? That's how... Uh, that's how the horsemen of the Chaldeans are. Once they fixate on, on their target, they go in for the kill instantly, immediately, right? God is talking about how brutish they are. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. They shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. So they don't have any respect for anybody that has titles, whether they be kings, princes, uh, queens, whatever their titles are, you know, chief of staff, whatever, you know, ambassadors. It doesn't matter. Whatever the title is, they have no respect. As a matter of fact, they, they target those with titles. You know, um, Anybody that's in authority, they, they're looking specifically for them to bring them down. And if you think that your walls can't be scaled, they specialize in scaling your walls. That's your stronghold. If you think your walls can't be scaled, they can scale your walls. If you think that they, it's too thick to break through, they can break them down. You have no protection against their military might. And they're being used by God to exact his justice. That's, that's what's so compelling here. And that's why God said, lo, he says, I will work a work in your days which you will not believe. And it's, and, and, and it's like, wait a minute, you're going to use evil to purge evil. That's, that's, and that's why God called it a marvelous work, because you, you won't believe it, right? Again, the complaint, that, that the concern and the complaint that Habakkuk has is that evil prevails in the land. The wicked have become brazen. And God says, okay, my remedy for that is I'm going to send some wickedness in there to purge the wickedness. <laughs> that's, this is a powerful this really is something that's heavy. I digress. We got scripture to cover. So, re rereading verse ten, they shall scuff at the end. They shall scuff at the kings, and the princes shall be scorned un unto them. They shall deride every stronghold. Again, 
your walls are, are, they'll be able to scale every wall, no matter how thick your stronghold is, they'll break, break through, break it down, break through. Uh, they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. So once he's done with the job, he moves on to the next instantly. He has no compassion. He doesn't stop to memorialize or to give eulogies from those that, that died. He doesn't take it personal. He just looks at it as a conquest and move on to the next instantly. His mind changes just like that. And he's not beholden to me. God is saying that they're not beholden to me. They'll look at their strength. And, and, and praise some uh, praise an, uh, uh, an idol for the strength that, you know, for the victory that they have in this conquest, right? They, that's, that's how they are. So that's heavy. So now that's, that's God's response to Habakkuk. Now, Habakkuk has a response to God after he was just given this vision, this burden, this vision, right? So this is what he tells God. And this is a relationship. This, this is when, when we see these things written, it helps us to, to gauge the interactions here. Because it's okay when you're in a relationship with God. You don't want to get in God's way. But it's okay to ask him things in prayer. You know, it's okay to, to ask him about the decisions he makes. That don't mean you're going to understand. But he prefers to have a relationship with you because he didn't make robots. He didn't make zombies, right? He did, that's not who he is. He didn't make us like that. He made us to have reason, to have compassion, right? To have an understanding. Uh, and so when God tells us that, Here's how I'm going to address the matter. It's okay for you to ask him, I, why would you do it that way? Because he made you to have reason. He didn't make you to get in his way, but it's okay for, for, for you to ask him. And we're going to see other examples of, of, we're going to see another example of somebody asking God some things, you know, about his plans, right? But I digress. So verse 12 Habakkuk, after he received this, this prophecy about how God is raising up this nation to come in there to purge evil, Habakkuk has this, has this, this response. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O my mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. He was like, wait a minute. Now, <laughs> these are a bunch of murderers that you're about to send into the land. Their job is to kill, steal, and destroy. <laughs> right? That's what they do. And you are a God that lives forever, and we are your children. How are you going to send them to wipe us out? You're not... You, you're not going to have us wiped out. You, you, you told us that we wouldn't be wiped out. You know, and so how, how does that look? How does, how does that jive? I don't understand. So that's, that's his question there. And then he was like, you sending the enemy in to chastise us, to correct us? You sending the enemy in? I, I don't get that. How does that jive? Thou art of pure eyes then to behold evil. And canst not look on the on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously? And holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? God, you're too holy. You too, you're too pure to be sending this nation in that's full of evil. To even look upon them as they do their dirt. How is that possible of you? I, I don't get that. Right? How, how, how would you allow that? I, I, I don't understand. And it's, that's, that's a, this is written here for our understanding. It's okay because as God made us and has given us a heart of reason and a heart of compassion, 
that we walk in love, that we walk in the righteousness of Jesus who is the Christ, we're washed with his blood, right? As we come into these things, surely we have compassion. And so we may not understand. So it's okay to ask God to reason with God about his plan, right? It's to reason. You just don't want to get in the way, right? You have to understand that God is the Lord of hosts. I'll give you another example of this. Go with me to, um, well, first I, I, I need to cover, uh, go back with me to Isaiah chapter 55. There's something I need to cover here. Yes, Isaiah chapter 55, and I was trying, I'm trying to make sure I don't get ahead of myself. And look what this says. This is Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 11. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from the heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth but and bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So God is, we don't understand, but not everything is for our, our understanding. And so God says that your ways are not my ways. My ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so God, as God puts this prophecy out here and says that what he's going to do, he put it out there so it's got to go and accomplish what he called it to do. And so when he don't need us to sign on to what he is doing, but he doesn't do anything without letting his prophets know what he's going to do in the earth. And again, the way he's made us, he's made us to be able to, to, to have a relationship with him, to question him. But we can't be trying to, well, if I was, if, if, if the choice was up to me, Lord, I would do it this way or do it. Well, our choice is not up to you. But he does communicate with his people about what it is that he's doing. And we're not able to see what, what it's going to accomplish, but it's going to glorify God in the end. The things that God does here on this earth, they're meant to glorify him. Amen? So we'll get in again to another example of being able to, to reason with God. Okay? So, but at, before we do that, let's continue to read. Uh, Thou art pure eyes. We read that. So verse 14. And makest men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no rule over them. They take up all of them with an angle. They catch them in their net and they gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. He was like these thugs, these mercenaries that you that you sent and in here, these, <laughs> these killers that are coming in here. Their sole aim, their sole purpose is to gather up as many as they can catch and kill them. That's what they're known for. And they celebrate. They 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 always celebrate the number of 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 those that they caught that they caught and killed. You know, it's always a topic of celebration with them. Therefore, they sacrifice unto their nets and they burn incense unto their drags because by them their portion is fat, their meat is plenteous. So they Therefore, empty their net and not, and not spare continually to slay the nations. You're sending them in to Israel. You're sending them in to Judah. You're going to keep, even after us, you're going to keep allowing them to go and do all of this and you not say anything about it? Now, God has this response in chapter 2. This, it's real, this is real heavy here. Chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me 
and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. Now, let's add some context here, because Habakkuk had an attitude. You could tell he had an attitude when he said, Shall they therefore empty their nets and not spare continually to slay the nations? He's like, are you just going to allow them to keep doing what they do and not, not intervene, not stop them? After us, who will they conquer next? You just going to stand by? And then, so he goes on to say, I'll tell you what. While you're waiting, while you're, while you're formulating your answer, I'll just come to, I'll just go into the watchtower and look out for them, you know, so I can see when they get here. I'll just, how about that? While I'm waiting to hear what you got to say, why don't I just climb up to the watchtower and be on the lookout, you know, and see when they coming, you know. He says, since, since you since you saying that that's what you're going to do, let me just, and he's not mocking God. He's just got, he has an attitude, you know. He's just like, I, I just go and watch and wait for him to get here. Since, since your plan is in motion, you know, fine, I'll just wait till they get. So then God says to him, Come down from there. I need what I told you. I need you to go publish it so that the so that people can read it and run to go get their houses in order. I didn't tell you for you to just keep it to yourself and to just watch and wait for the enemy to come. Perhaps the people may want to get their lives together. Perhaps they may want to change after they hear that I'm coming after their sins. Right. Maybe they'll read and, and hear this news of what I'm going to do. And maybe they'll change them themselves. Right. They, they, they may get their houses in order. I didn't give it to you for you to hoard it for yourself and then have an attitude setting up their festering because of what my plans are. This is my way. This is and then I'm, I'm using you to get the word out. I'm not using you to keep the word in. I'm using you to get the word out to alert and inform my children about what my plans are so that they can create some plans as to how to get out of the mess that they put themselves into. That's pretty interesting. That is heavy. God wants, when God tells us something, He's not trying to keep it inside. He, he's giving it to you so you can broadcast, so you can publish it. As we're reading the, the, what, what's in the, in the scriptures, guess what we're doing through YouTube, through, through the media outlets, Apple and Fire TV, Google TV, um, uh, uh, and various other platforms. We're getting the word out about how God was how God uh, was and still is, right? We're living in a time of grace. What you're seeing right now, what we're reading about right now is there is a window from the time God revealed to Habakkuk about what he's going to do to the time that the Babylonians actually showed up. There was a window there. And in that window, the children of, of Israel, the, the Jews, the southern tribe of Israel, Judah, they had an opportunity to repent. They had that time of grace from the time God told Habakkuk to the time that the, 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 the Chaldeans, the Babylonians showed up. That window was a time of grace. And that's what God specifies. Look at what he says here. The Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon, upon the tables or tables or upon the tablets that he, that he uh, may run that read it. So the person that reads, oh, the Babylonians are coming here? Oh, no. Uh-oh. Oh no, I gotta I, I can't be involved. I can't, I can't continue to do what I'm doing. I need to go change. I need to get my house in order. I need to repent. See, do you understand that? And, and so that's the whole thing. That's 
And if you if if Habakkuk would have kept it to himself, how many lives were how many people repented based off of what how they were informed? You know that that the Babylonians were coming. Some may have not taken it seriously, but some may have. And in doing so, maybe their lives were spared, right? So that's pretty interesting. The prophet called an attitude, went to the watchtower and said, fine, I'll just, I'll just be on watch. Since that's your plans and that's how you get things done, you know, you are the Lord of hosts. And if that's what you're going to do, fine. And the Lord was like, no, nah, I need you to get down there. I need you to come down from that watchtower. Don't be looking out. Don't look out to see when the enemy's coming. I need you to take what I've told you and to broadcast it, to publish it so that you give the people a chance, right? So, and that's what he did. But look at what's interesting here. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. So that's this time of grace for the people to get themselves together. But at the end, it shall speak. It's going to happen, right? That's what he's saying. And not lie. Remember what when we read Isaiah where he said that he, his word goes out and it doesn't come back void? So that's, that's, that's confirming that. When it says that it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. It will tarry not. So God says, it, it's not happening instantly. I set it out to accomplish at the very time that it's supposed to happen. And when it happened, it's going to, it's going to happen, right? And he said, it's, it's set in motion, right? And then he says, surely, he said, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now, this is one of the most profound things here. Verse four, behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. And what is God saying here? One of the complaints that Habakkuk has is that, Lord, not everybody is, is evil. Remember what he said, that the wicked compass the righteous. So when he, in, in him saying that, he's saying that never, not everybody is evil in the land. You're... You're sending a bunch of murderers that's going to target everyone. Not everyone is evil, though. Not everybody is up to no good. The, the righteous may be a minority, but they're still righteous. How will you, how do you reconcile that? And God says the just shall live by faith. And, and what he means there is that those that are living for me, I will protect them. I'm not pulling my troops back. But I will cover those. They may have to go into exile, but they will live. No harm will come to those that, that put their trust in me and that lives for me. Those that trust, those that believe, those that have faith in me, I will not let hurt, harm, or danger come unto them. They may be relocated. But life will go on for them, and they won't be harmed. The just shall live by faith. That's what he's saying there. And that's a powerful statement. And hold your place there and go with me to Genesis chapter one, uh, chapter 18, rather. Genesis chapter 18. Remember when I said it's okay for you to question and plan a God because God made you. He didn't make you a zombie. He didn't make you... Um, a robot, he, he gave you a heart and a mind to reason, right? He just don't need you in his way. It's okay for you to ask him. But, you know, don't, don't be trying to, you know, get in his way of things. Um, I wanted to give you an example. Look at this. This is Genesis chapter 18, beginning at verse 16. The men rose up from thence, and they looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abram that thing which I do? So God came off the stone, came down um, and surveilled. God was told about what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, 
right? I'm under the impression that this may have been Jesus uh, that have come. I could be wrong, but I, I, I believe that, you know, Jesus came down and, and, and he was shown. You got, and, and that's just me. I, I, I digress. Let me just stick with the scripture here. The Lord said, I sh should I hire from Abram that thing which I do? Because remember, God with his people, with his prophets, he liked to let them know what's going to happen before it happens. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abram that which he had spoken of him. The Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. So the reports that God have gotten about Sodom and Gomorrah, I believe he sent his son to see, to, to take the report, to see what, what, what the going zones was. Right. And he had a plan to fix it <laughs> if the reports were true. So the men turned their faces from thence and they went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord and Abram drew near and said, will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? This is the complaint that Habakkuk has. Perhaps or preadventure there be 50 righteous within the city, will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? It's okay. To, this is the relationship that we have with God. It's okay to ask God, to reason with him. But at the end of it, there is a time, there is, what did, what did uh, uh, in Ecclesiastics, what did, what did uh, uh, Solomon say? That there's a time and a season for all things. Well, there's a time to speak, but there's also to be quiet. There's a time to be quiet. So this is the time to speak, right? So you got the time to speak and to, to, to say, hey, Lord, are you? I know you're the God of the, of the universe. You're the sovereign king of the universe. I, that's, that's a bold move that you're making that you would kill everyone. What about those that are righteous? It's okay because that's who we are. He made us to have compassion. So it's okay to ask him. That's what he wants. He wants that dialogue with us, right? The Lord said, if I... He says, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Abram answered and said, behold, now I've taken upon me to speak unto the, unto the Lord, which I am but dust and ashes. Perhaps there shall lack five of the 50 righteous without destroy. So what if there's 45 instead of 50, which you still destroy? Now, this goes on and on. We won't continue to read. But I wanted to give you an example of how it's okay to reason with God about those things that God reveals to us. There is a time to speak, but we're going to see that there is also a time to keep silent. But in that time to speak, it's okay to, to address your concerns with God, especially when he reveals his plans. If he gives you the window, it's okay. That's okay. Amen? So, but that's, that's part of our relationship with him. And I just think that that's a beautiful thing. I digress. I wanted to share that with you because this is, this is pretty interesting. So let's get back into it. So uh, chapter two here. Uh, ye shall out, let me see, uh, verse five. Ye also, because he trans, oh, he said the just shall live by faith. So we understand that, that God is not in the business of taking out the righteous with the unrighteous. He's not his he's going to see that his wrath doesn't fall upon them. That's what it means here when it's written the just shall live by faith. That because we live for God, he is going to take care of us. We won't be caught up 
uh, in, in his wrath when he sends his troops in to, to come after the wicked. Okay? He is going to use evil to purge evil. Okay? Uh, and, and those that are not involved in evil, they're, they're not going to be targeted. And that's what that verse is saying. So verse 5, ye also, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home. Uh, who enlarges his desire as hell and is as death and cannot satisfy or cannot be satisfied, but gather unto him all nations and heapeth him, heapeth unto him all people. So now God, God sets his sights upon those troops that he sends in, that he's going to send in. God is going to look at those Babylonians and, 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 he, he, so he lets Habakkuk know two things. The Babylonians will come in and purge Judah of their wickedness. But then God is going to purge the Babylonians. And that's what, you're going, that's what we're going to start to read. And, and what's so surprising about it is God says that the very things that they've done to others, it's going to be done unto them. He's not, just as God is not going to let the sinners that are in Judah off the hook, he is not going to let the Babylonians off the hook. So that's what we're reading from verse 5 on. Yea, also because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlarges his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied. But he gather unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Shall not all these take up a parable against him and a touting proverb against him and say, woe to him that increases that which is not his? How long? And to him that layeth himself with thick clay. So the, that who has an appetite for blood and death should not blood and death have an appetite for you. Right? That's what it's saying. And that it's basically saying whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's a law that God set into motion. And it's, it's, it's going to happen. Verse 7. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake, the, and awake that shall vex thee and thou shall be booties for unto them? So those that you bit, those that you vexed, those that you plundered, now you're going, now the vexed are going to vex you. They're going to plunder you. Um, and and those that you've bitten will now bite you. So the very things that you've done to others will come back onto you. This is a law that God has set into motion. And so whatever we've done in the past, and we repented of, and we move forward, you may have atoned for what you've done, but that what you've done still need to be reconciled because you, you set something into motion. Do you understand that? It has to be, God is going to be, the, because you've repented, God is going to be there with you as you go through it. But you still set forth a course of action in the midst of your sins. So whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And so the Babylonians are not exempt from that. Because of the maim, the violence, the destructions, the, the sexual immoralities, the plundering, all of those things that they've done unto others, it's going to come back onto them. And just as the Babylonians are not exempt, no one else is exempt from that. So those that, are, those that have come out of the world and come into the kingdom, and you repented and you accept Jesus as Lord and Christ, that's the way to go. That's the only path to take. There is no other path that leads to salvation and that leads to the Father. The problem is, as you come out of the world, the dirt that you've done, the things that you've done, that has to be reconciled. God is going to be there with you. 
so that, that you don't succumb to that stuff. But those things have to be reconciled because you've sown, you set a course of actions. You set forth a course of actions when you, when you were involved in that. Amen? And that's what you're seeing about the Babylonians. Verse 8, because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of those people shall spoil thee. Because of the men's blood and for the violence of the land and the city and all that dwell therein. Woe to him that coveteth and evil covetedness to his house. That he may set his nest on high that he may be delivered from the power of evil. You've taken your might and you've plundered. And you've looted people. You've taken from them. You use it to build your empire. And you try to fortify it to set it high and to make it a fortress where nothing could come up to it. No evil could, could, could invade it. But you can't keep the law of the, of the Lord out. It just don't work like that. You use evil, the riches you've gained from your evil, to build your, your kingdom. And, th and you want to believe that your kingdom is safe. But it's not. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off or by killing the people. And hast sinned against thine own soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establisheth a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire and that the people shall weary themselves for the very vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So, when God comes after the Babylonians, just as the Babylonians were allowed to go through and to conquer nations and territories. When, God's, when God brings them down. People, because as brutish as they are. People will look and, and be like who can conquer them. But when they get brought down. That sends forth glory to the Lord. Like only God could have brought down somebody that, that brutish. Only God could have did that. And when you look at all the waters of the of the how the waters of the of, of, of our planet covers the earth, that's the glory of God. What when God does things is for his glory. And just as waters covers the earth, we it should it should sat just the glory of the Lord should be saturated that way as well. Okay. Woe, verse 15, 15, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and maketh him drunk it also, that thou mayest look upon their nakedness. So you exploit, uh, and, and you take advantage of your neighbors by giving them drink. This is what nations do to other nations, especially a rich nation will go to another nation and they'll say, ally with us. And they'll make them drink of their particular cup and get them drunk and then exploit them. Look, gain, gain advantage over them. Look for their weaknesses and expose them. Right? Look at verse 16. Thou art filled with the shameful glory. Drink thou also and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. So what you've done to others to cause them to stumble, to other nations and cause other nations to stumble, what you've done to your neighbor to get them drunk, and then as they're drunk with whatever you gave them, with, with whatever concoction you gave them, now you take advantage of them. You, 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 you shame them by showing their nakedness. God is saying that the same thing that you've done to others are, is going to come unto you to where you will be, ne you will be weakened you will be exploited. You will be taken advantage of and the shame of your nakedness will be revealed. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee. The spoil of the beast which uh, made them afraid because of the men's blood and for the violence of the land, the city and all that dwell in. So, so what God is saying here is 
when the Babylonians would come into a territory, they would cut down the trees. They would kill beasts. They would kill the men. They, they just do everything. All of those things are going to happen unto them now. The very, the very war advances, the, the things that they did militarily to other nations will be done unto them militarily. What profited the graven image that the maker thereof has graven it? The molten image, uh, a teacher of lies, that maker of his work trusted therein to make dumb idols. Woe unto him that said to the wood, awake, to the dumb stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in, in, the, in the midst of it. So it's like, it's like if I was a head of a nation and I take a pen and I, I sign some legislation and, and then that legislation I'm looking at saying, you know, no hurt, harm, or danger should come unto me. And, and then I look at this pen that I signed the legislation with and I began to worship the pen because the pen giving me the authority to sign my name to the legislation that's protecting me. So I worship the pen, right? Ooh, the, ooh glory to this pen. This is my sacred pen. You know, and I began to bow and worship to the pen because it helped to produce the legislation that saved me, right? So, and that's, what, that's, the, that's the stupidity of things. And that's what God is saying, that even these Babylonians, they look at their nets, they look at their swords, their horses. They worship stuff that can't save them, things that help them to gain the victory. They begin to worship those things. But those things are dumb. And when God comes, he is going to show that those things that you worshiped as idols that you attributed your victories to, when I send a new nation to come and get you, those things are not going to save you. Those things that you believed was, was your answer that gave you the strength and power to be victorious in your conquest. Those things will not help you when I have targeted you. And so we have to look at the same thing, right? The, when we look at our nation, we look at certain governments, certain people to put into offices to, to save us. Right. We look at certain people to, to, to save us from from this and from that. We we to the point that we'll look at them people as idols. That we will actually look at them as our saviors, as do the you know, the government is going to save us from this and from that. To the point that we begin to idolize them. We come against our neighbors, come against our brothers for the political party that we have idolized. And we look at that political party as though it's going to save us. Only God can save. And God will allow, just as we see the Babylonians become the new government of the world, during, as, as we read this, God would allow a government to come in and to purge. God would allow an evil government to come in and to purge the evil that's in the land. That's how that goes. And that's the problem that Habakkuk has. That God is going to allow evil. And then God says, don't worry about it. Because after they accomplish what I purpose them to do, then I'm coming after them for what they've done and, and, and what they've done to not only you, but what they've done to others. I'm coming after them too. So they, God is not going to let that government off the hook, but he will allow a government to come in and to purge the land of evil. And before that government comes in, God gives you a chance to get your act together. He gives you a chance. You see the writing on the wall. And he'll say, go and get, go get your house in order. Go and repent. Because when they get up in there, they're going to come heavy and hard. And it's not them. 
it's I, and it's not because of them, it's because of you why I sent them in there because you didn't cry out loud enough. You, you, you didn't cry out loud enough about what was wrong. You allowed them to come after the children. You allowed them to come after the neighbors, to exploit, to punt, to, to plunder, to, to curse God in public, you know. You allowed them to do so much and you did so little to the point that you became complacent. So God will allow a government to come in there, a nation to come in, that's how that goes. But you have to understand that God is. And as long as we are about being a people of faith, it don't matter who's in charge. God will take care of us. Amen. Got to finish this up here. So we we'll unto to him that said to the world awake and the dumb stone arise and it shall teach behold. It is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in his hope. Now, this is the part. This is one of the funniest parts here. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. So <laughs> I don't want to have to talk to you no more about what I'm going to do, Habakkuk. Conversation is done. Remember, I was saying there's a time to speak and there's a time to keep a time to keep silent. Then here it is, the time to keep silent. God says, We're not gonna talk about this no more. That's it. Hush your mouth. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I don't want to hear from nobody else about what these Babylonians are set to do. Hush your mouth. <laughs> right? So God said, I'm in my temple. Shut up. <laughs> Not another word. God gives you know how a parent gives that look. You know you get that that parent give you that look. It's time to don't say just let it go. Just just you went too far. Don't don't say nothing else. And that's it. You let it go. So that's chapter one and two. Chapter three is a prayer that's in a song format. It's a song of praise and worship, but it's also a prayer. And I can tell you, we're just going to read it. There's nothing really to talk about. What you know evident here is that Habakkuk becomes a changed man. Because we read a couple scriptures where it says that God, his ways are far from our ways. And that God is not going to allow the righteous to perish. Enough said. Don't be in, don't be in a watchtower sitting there with an attitude. Be active about what God is going to do. Broadcast it, proclaim it, declare it so that others will know and be able to get their houses together. All of those things were done. And then God says, not only will I purge the evil out of your land, but, but the evil that I'm sending in through the Babylon, I'm coming after them too. And once all of those things were addressed, Habakkuk had a change of heart. To where he began to have this prayer of song and praise and worship towards God. So much so that he even put together somewhat of a poem or, or a song to add music to. So for us, we'll just read it, but there's nothing really to elaborate. I'll only say that you'll see him being a changed man because there is not contention in his conversation with God anymore. So we'll just read this chapter three. We'll be done with it. Again, there's nothing really for me to elaborate on. It's just because this is a, a prayer of song and praise that's meant to have music to it. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Saganath. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from the Mount from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens. The earth was filled with the full of his praise. His brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hands, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pest with the uh, pest, pestilence. 
and the burning coals went at uh, uh, went before or went forth at his feet rather. He stood and he measured the earth. He beheld and he drove asunder the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the river? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thou wrath, was thy wrath against the sea? that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots uh, of salvation. Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribe, even, the, even thy word, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in the habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and all the shining of thy glistering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thrust the heathens in anger. Thou went forth uh, for thy salvation of thy people, even for the salvation with thine, with, with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundations of the neck. Selah. Thou didst strike through the, with his staves and his head uh, of his villages. They came out of a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horse through the heaps of the great waters. When I heard my belly tremble, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in a day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops, because he is the Lord of hosts. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail. And the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. And there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And that's a powerful part of the song. The song of praise that he gives to God. Regardless of whatever happens when the Babylonians come. I will still rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in, in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer of my string instruments. Eternal God, I thank you for such an excellent conversation that you allow to be recorded. For our understanding, you allowed it to be written for our understanding. With it, help us to understand that your ways are higher than that of our own. Help us to develop our relationship with you. That just as the prophet constantly came to you with cares and concern, that we can develop our prayer lives and our relationship with you. God, I thank you for being open to such a relationship with us. Have your way with us individually and collectively. And just as you did the children of, of Judah, the children of Israel, help us to get our houses in order. Help us to repent. Help us to draw closer to you, to live for you. Help us to be as those, as you said, the just shall live by faith. Help us, Father, that we are those whom you spare, that we live according to our faith and our trust in you. Above all and moreover, help us to glorify you through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Send forth, send forth laborers for the harvest and be ye glorified. In Jesus' name we pray.
Go with me quickly uh, to Matthew 11. I'll read through these very quick. This is the path. You can always find, uh, if you go to our website, you can always find the path laid out for you to obtain the gift of salvation. We've read about what's going to happen to those that walk contrary to the ordinances and the precepts of God. Those that are in con contradiction of his righteousness. The fate that will befall them. Here is how, here's how you are saved from that. It starts with Jesus Christ offering you an invitation to be saved. He says, come unto me. This is Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The one thing you got to understand is he... He has, his, he has the best life that he wants to give you. He's got your, he's got your interests at heart that he wants you to come and join him, be a part of the family, come and be partakers of his kingdom, right? And then if he says, take and learn, he says, learn of me. Forget what they've been saying, what the world has been saying about me. You try me for yourself and come and learn of me. And what, and what you'll find out is how, is how I have your best interests at heart. You'll find that out, that I'm for you before I'm against you. You'll find that out. But, you, but when you come to him, you have to turn away from the world because it's not going to work in the kingdom of God. Remember, we spent the, the, better, the better part of an hour and a half talking about how the old world is going to fade away. And God is ushering in the new world. He's ushering in the new heaven and the new earth. And the old is going to be done away with. And so now is the time for us to prepare for what will be. And Christ is offering us, the Messiah, Emmanuel, he is offering that platform, that bridge of transition and change unto us. Amen? Go with me to Romans chapter 11, or chap Romans, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Romans 10, verses 9 through 13. This is how you accept Jesus as Lord. This is how you accept his invitation. You first turn away from the world because when he says, come unto me, that means leave the world behind and come to me. Now you commit to making him Lord of your life. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. You know how you give your wedding vows. You say, do, the, the man of God will say, do you take this man or do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded husband or your lawfully wedded wife. And you say, I do, right? Well, this is what you're saying to Jesus, that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, you're saying, I do make you Lord of my life. That's what you're doing. I make you Lord of my life. I commit to marrying you and to obeying you, okay? And shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's factoring in, confession and faith that you believe you believe that Jesus is the only begotten son of God that laid down his life for us and was and was brought back to life after 3 days and 3 nights and is alive forevermore and he is the one that will reign and rule in the millennium the safekeeping of our souls have been placed in his hand Amen. And if you believe it and you confess that he is Lord, you are saved. What are you being saved from? We just covered that. We just covered that. That's you're being saved from the wrath of God that's going to fall upon the whole 
the whole world. Amen. I will go back and reference the Gospel of John chapter 3 and 36, but I want you to do it. It's basically saying what we've already said. Your, re your rejection of your rebellion against God and your rejection of his only begotten son. And, and that's the wrath. But if you take this path, you enjoy, you, 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 uh, excuse me. If you take this path, you're removed from the wrath that's going to come upon the earth. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And so there's good and bad. That as God would punish the children of Israel, he would punish his children that are Gentiles. And the good is that God was saving his children, the Jews. He's also looking to save us, the Gentiles. So there's no difference with God when it comes to salvation being offered between the Jews and the Gentiles. There's no difference when it comes to that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is going to save you. He promises to do that. But you have to put yourself in position to be saved by turning away from your sins. That's repentance. By confessing Jesus as Lord. Okay? Calling upon him and letting him know that I make you Lord of my life. Quickly go with me to 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is letting you know this is part of that path. When Christ says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, this is what it means to come to him turning away from your sins and then let God know, let him know through prayer what it is that you repented of so that it never gets brought up again. God even takes it out of the enemy because the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. At, at this time, he has, he has permission to go to the throne of God to accuse us right there at the throne. But the time is going to come to where He's going to be put into the pit. But until he's put into the pit, those things that you've been forgiven of and that the blood of the lamb has washed you clean of, God doesn't give the enemy permission to, to bring it up because God himself is not trying to hear about it. And as long as you turned away from it, you disarm the enemy. You take away his argument against you. That's, that's the bottom line. But if you're still living in your sin, then the enemy is constantly bringing it up because he wants God to penalize you. He wants God to turn him loose on you. OK. And so once you do what you're supposed to and you start walking right with God, then the enemy has to he has to get up off of you. He can't even bring a case against you. He could try to make one, but he can't bring one. He could try to tempt you. But as long as you're covered in the armor of God and you resist him, he has nothing to complain about at the throne of God. Amen. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If you're not honest about what's broken about you, then you can't be saved. If you live in deceit and dishonesty, there's nothing that the word can do for you. Amen. Lastly, and quickly, go with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. And I'll just read through this. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. And what Peter is saying here is that Surely those that have gathered here in this upper room on this particular day of Pentecost, that's the backdrop of what's going on here. Surely those that are here 
It's hard to believe that any of you would have taken nails and drive them through the hands of Jesus, crucifying them on the cross, taking nails and driving them through the feet as he was crucified on the cross. But your lifestyle, those unrepented sins, those sins that you haven't repented of, that, that makes you just as guilty as those that had done that to him. Okay, you may say, I, I, I'm not doing all those things. But sin in your life, period, makes you just as guilty, guilty as those that had nailed Jesus to the cross. Now, when they heard this, they were convicted or they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and, bro men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do to get our life in order? When God convicts us, he's letting us know that there's something amiss within our lives and it's going to cost us if we don't get those things reconciled between him and ourselves. If we don't do our part to, to get a handle on that stuff, it's going to cost us, right? And God is convicting you to try to move you to take action, okay? So don't disregard those convictions. God got, he has that there for a reason. And that means that he hasn't given up on you. When he convicts you, it's because he hasn't given up on you. So stop giving up on yourself. Do something about what's happening with your situation. Take hold of it before God turns you over. You don't want him to turn you over. Amen? When I say turn you over, turn you over to the enemy or turn you over to yourself. That's the worst that he can do to you. So Peter says, repent. Turn away from your sins first and foremost. Then Peter gives us the instruction, be ye baptized you know, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the, for the remission of sins. Now, let's talk about the ceremony of baptism. Christ was nailed to the cross, laying down his life, meaning that he died on the cross, taken down off the cross, and laid to rest in the tomb. He was laid to rest in the tomb. Remember, he was dead. For three days and for three nights, he laid to rest. After three days and three nights, he was brought back to life. Laid to rest brought back to life okay when we go through the ceremony of baptism we are uh, some fully submerged in the water that represents us being buried in christ jesus okay when we go down into the water being fully submerged we are buried in jesus christ when we come up out of the water we are resurrected in jesus christ your old man goes down your new man comes up all of your sins are washed away. You remember in our Bible study, we talked about God getting rid of the old to make room for the new. This is the process of you inheriting the new, your name being counted amongst those in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is that process. Your old man has to be done and away with. Your new man has to come forth so that you can take part in the new world uh, uh, with the kingdom of God. Amen. That starts now. Your training of inheriting that which is to come starts now. But the old man has to go down. The new man has to come up. Amen. So that's the ceremony of baptism. That's why we do it. We're told to do it. And I've given you the reason of why we go through it. So that your old man can go down and your new man can come up and all of your sins can be washed away so make sure you get it done amen um, and you shall receive the gift of the holy ghost god puts his spirit inside of us to seal us up we're the only ones that can break the seal people contend with that statement that i make but god is a god of free will and if you don't want to be saved no more you can you just be like god i'm tired of it i'm gonna do what i want to do that's you breaking the seal okay that's the only way that that the, the enemy don't have the, the the enemy don't have the power or authority to break your seal. He can tempt you to get you to break your own seal. You're sealed up. Imagine uh, you're being put in an envelope, and that envelope is sealed up. Nobody has the authority to to break that seal open, but the Lamb of God and you. You can break that seal by saying, "I don't want to be saved no more. I don't want to live." According to, and you go on about your life and you're perish with the rest. Amen. The, the enemy don't have all he can do is tempt you to make you try.
to do it against yourself. So that's why God gives us his spirit so that he can be inside of us. His spirit is constantly uh, uh, transforming us on the inside out, giving you a hunger and a thirst of righteousness, making you, moving you towards prayer, uh, uh, getting into the doctrine of, of the word of God, you know. It's moving you towards those holy and godly things that when you were, in, as a natural man, you thought these things were foolish. Now, because you're spiritual, having received the spirit of God and you're spiritual, these things are not, are not foolish to you any longer. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. God is always trying to call us out of darkness, but it's up to us if we're willing to come into the light that he's that he offers us he's always the invitation is always there but it's up to you if you're going to accept it and it don't matter where you come from or what you or what you've done what matters is what you're willing to do at this point and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying save yourselves from this untoward generation that applies to us today save yourselves from this crooked or perverse generation that applies to us that's what we when reading about in Isaiah about those that didn't separate themselves those that didn't call upon Jesus Christ to be Lord amen and that's what that's what Peter is constantly telling us we got to take this thing seriously then they that gladly received the word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls and now, and here is another path set before us, how to grow stronger and closer to God. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayers. God keeps, when, whatever God used to get you saved, whether it's Bible study, uh, you, 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 you started following a friend to the place of worship and, and you received, you, you started receiving some truth. Whatever God has done to get you on the path to salvation, it takes a, a practice and a continuation of those things to keep you getting stronger. It takes a daily dose or, or a regimen of those same activities to not only get you stronger, but to see you to the end. Once you start pulling back on those things, then you're in danger of falling back. And once you're in, da once you're, you're in danger of stopping, and from stopping, you're in danger of falling back, which, in, which is backsliding. So don't stop doing those things that got you to where you are. It, you, it takes a continuation of that, a regimen of that to keep you moving forward. Amen? Uh, verse 43, fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were, com were together and had all things common. This is the brotherhood. It's talking about the brotherhood. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with God all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved God we take this opportunity to thank you for the path of salvation for the gift of life the gift of eternal life with you and with Jesus who is Christ father I thank you also for calling all of us out of darkness and giving us an opportunity to take hold of that light Father, those that have accepted the call, those that have accepted the invitation, we pray for them, that you help them to remain repentant. Father, that they accept Jesus as Lord and that they become sons and daughters of God and not return back to their former lust. We pray for them, Father, that you would place them in places of worship. Father, to where they can not only worship you, but magnify Jesus and edify our brothers and sisters. We pray that not only you fill them with the Spirit of God, but that you also give them an understanding of their gifts and callings and use them for the sake of your glory. 
It's our petition for those whom you've called out of darkness and have answered the call. Father, I thank you for increasing the size of our family and keeping the door open for us to become citizens of the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name and we pray. Amen. Uh, this is Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. If you have any unrepented sin in your life, you won't be able to take advantage of these blessings. Remember, sin brings about curses. Obedience brings about your blessings, right? And so this is a blessing. The word bless is littered all in this, right? But you can't let curses, you know, be a soldier at the gate uh, warding off your blessings. You know, because you, you got sin in the gate, so curses is standing outside of the gate, may, you know, bombarding any blessings that would otherwise enter in. So you got to do away with, you got to get rid of the, 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 the sins in your life so that you can dismiss the curses that are standing guard. Uh, I watch, my wife and I, lately we've been watching The Lord of the Rings. I don't remember, there's three of them, man. <laughs> and if you ever go back and watch those, I mean, those like, if you watch all three of them, that's a good 12 hours, right? But they're very, if they, they really do have such a spiritual meaning to it. I don't remember which one, if it's the first or the second or the third, but there was a king. And this king had this, this, um, like his 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 hand his his right hand person had put some kind of spell over him and so the king couldn't receive any counsel he was like a zombie he couldn't rule he he couldn't give good orders he couldn't call out good things he couldn't he couldn't acknowledge things all he can do was be a servant to the to darkness because his right-hand person that didn't have his best interests at heart had a spell over him. It's similar, to having, it's similar to having sin in your life. And that sin is stopping any goodness from coming at you. Do you see what I'm saying? It's deflecting any goodness from coming at you. Right? And, and then outside of the, of the gates, it's got curses reinforcing the, the entrance to make sure blessings can't come in. That's how significant it is. So you got to make sure that you get sins out of your life so that you can fully embrace what God is trying to give you. Amen. Remember, it's a God of free will. So he is, he, he respects the fact that you choose curses over blessings. He respects that. Okay. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I loose this on you that you would receive it in Jesus' name, that you prosper, that you're transformed, and that you're anchored down in the will of God, and that you place not only God but his kingdom first, always at all, and at all times, that you yourself shall prosper. Receive the blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you for your, your prayers and your proceeds and your support of the ministry. I love you. My wife and I, our family, we love you. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Bible study. Okay.